Om Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahai Tejasvi Navadi Tamastu Ma Vidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 And we'll attempt to share the screen here. We go July 21. And our first topic is the publisher's def desk defining our faith. It has a threefold answer to the basic question, who is a Hindu and what is Hinduism? 2006. Easier if I put on my glasses. Here we go. I had the opportunity to give a number of lectures, classes, seminars, and presentations at our monastery in Hawaii and Hindu temples in Toronto and Edmonton, the Dharma Summit 2005 Conference of North American Hindu Temples and Institutions, New Brunswick, New Jersey. During question and answer sessions and in casually talking to those attending, discussions arose on who is a Hindu and what is Hinduism. The concerns of those asking the questions varied considerably. Therefore, the nature of my answers also varied somewhat. Compiled my responses in a threefold answer that you may find useful. When these commonly asked questions come up in your community, business, or social circles. So, first idea, Hinduism is the Sanatana Dharma. How would you explain the concept of Sanatana Dharma? So that's a complex question. I'll give you a couple of minutes on that one. First part of my answer to who is a Hindu and what is Hinduism is that Hinduism is the Sanatana Dharma, or eternal religion. So eternal religion is an English translation of Sanatana Dharma. <clears throat> it is the innate perennial philosophy. Hinduism does not have a founder. It has neither a beginning nor an end. It is coexistent with man himself. It is not one man's teachings or interpretation, nor is it limited to a single facet of religion. It consists of the entire prism. It is a God-centric religion. The center of it is God. All other religions are prophet-centric. Interesting point. Here's a quote from Gurudeva on this concept. The search for truth for God is called the Sanatana Dharma or the eternal path because it is inherent in the soul itself where religion begins. This path, this return to his source is ever existent in man and is at work whether he is aware of the processes or not. There is not this man's search and that man's search and where does the impetus come from? It comes from the inside of man himself. Thus, Hinduism is ever vibrant and alive, for it depends on this original source of inspiration, this first impulse of the spirit within, giving it an energy and a vibrancy that is renewable eternally in the now. 
The idea that Hinduism resides within each of us and our soul was highlighted in Hinduism today many years ago in an article about Pat Robertson. As part of his goal of making the United States a Christian nation, the Evangelical Baptist leader made an outrageous public statement that Hindus should not be allowed to immigrate to the United States. It's not working out very well. <clears throat> The late and distinguished spokesman for Hinduism, Ram Sarup of New Delhi, gave an insightful reply which we printed. In part, he stated, Robertson wants to keep out Hindus from America, but would, but he, but would he be able to keep out Hinduism from the seeking humanity? Hinduism resides in all seeking hearts, and whenever a man seeking for God becomes spiritual, Hinduism or the tradition of Sanatana Dharma automatically comes in. In what way and how long could man's innermost truth be kept away from him? Really good answer. As expressed in this statement and in Gurudeva's insight, the Hindu concept is that each soul is moving ever closer to God over a period of many lives. And when a soul reaches sufficient spiritual maturity, it naturally awakens a conscious desire to know God as its inmost essence, to experience truth personally. This spiritual longing then leads the soul to take up the practices and study the philosophy of Sanatana Dharma in order to complete the process of knowing itself. Thus, it is quite clear from the Hindu point of view that you cannot keep Sanatana Dharma out of a country when it already resides within the soul of every person in that country, waiting to be expressed at some point in the future. We can compare the inherent search for truth that exists within the soul to a dormant seed hidden in the soil, waiting for the right conditions to sprout. This first response, Sanatana Dharma, is the philosophical and mystical definition of Hinduism. Oh, it's a bit deep and may not be the answer you choose to give, but it's there for those who are ready to hear it. Okay, and then we have our second definition. Hinduism is the Vaidika Dharma. How would you explain the concept of Vaidika Dharma? That one's pretty easy if you know what the word Vaidika means. Oh, Vedika means Vedic. <clears throat> In English, Vedic. Second part of the answer to who is a Hindu, to who is a Hindu and what is Hinduism, is that Hinduism is the Vedika Dharma or religion of the Vedas. In other words, Hinduism encompasses all religious traditions that accept the Vedas as scriptural authority. Religious traditions in India that do not accept the Vedas are Indian but not Hindu. Among these are Jainism, Buddhism, and Sikhism, which rejected the Vedas and thus emerged as completely distinct religions, disassociated from Hinduism while still sharing many philosophical insights and cultural values with their parent faith. The Vedas are revealed scripture, or shrupti, meaning that which is heard. As we know, they are timeless teachings transmitted to rishis or seers directly by God thousands of years ago. For countless centuries, the Vedas, particularly their Upanishads, have been the basis of philosophical inquiry, debate, and commentary. This attention has given rise to countless schools of thought. Revealed scripture is also the subject of deep study, meditation, and yogic practice to realize the wisdom of the ancients within oneself. 
Most of Hinduism sacred mantras are drawn from Shruti, used for rites of worship, both public and domestic, as well as personal prayer and japa. Sometimes the Bhagavad Gita is put forward as Hinduism's core scripture, its Bible. This, of course, is not the case. The Bhagavad Gita is a historical epic, or itihasa. Accepted as a central scripture by Vaishnava and Smarta followers, but not so regarded in the Shakta or Saiva traditions. The Vedas are the revealed scriptures that all Hindus hold in common. Oh, as I've mentioned before, in North America, it's common for in hotel rooms for there to be a religious scripture and the religious scripture is generally the Bible. And sometimes Hindu groups want to get a Hindu scripture into the hotel rooms and usually the proposal is the Bhagavad Gita, but if you're going to put a Hindu scripture in hotel rooms, it should be something from the Vedas. It could be selected Upanishads, for example. It is also vital to mention that scripture in Hinduism does not have the same place as it does in many other faiths. Hinduism is premised on realization to be enlightened. One must have personal experience of the truth set out in the Vedas. It is not sufficient in Hinduism to simply own, read, and believe in a holy text, even the Vedas. Another point regarding Vedika Dharma is that sometimes the words Hindu and Indian are used in ways that make them synonymous. Of course, they are not. All Hindus are not Indians, and all Indians are not Hindus. Strictly using the term Hindu to refer only to those whose religion accepts the authority of the Vedas helps keep this confusion of terms from arising. This second response is the scriptural and liturgical definition of Hinduism, oh, Vedas. Religion of the Vedas. Then we get our third one. It relates to Hinduism's major denominations. So what are Hinduism's major denominations? Third part of the answer to who is a Hindu and what is Hinduism is that Hinduism is a religion comprised of four primary sectarian traditions known in Sanskrit as Mata. So Mata can be translated as denomination. <clears throat> and of course we know what they are, Saivism, Vaishnavism, Shaktism, and Smartism. So there are minor denominations. I'm not trying to say these are the only denominations. But these are the major ones at this point in time. And Saivite's God is Shiva. This is basic material for the pub desk. Shakta's God is Shakti is supreme. Vaishnavite's Lord Vishnu is God. Smartas who see all deities as reflection of the one God, the choice of deity is left to the devotee. So that's the concept of Ishta, or choice, Ishta Devata. In other words, Hinduism is not just a one faith, but a family of myriad faiths, which holds such divergent beliefs that each is a complete and independent religion. Yet they share a vast heritage of culture and belief Karma, Dharma, reincarnation, all pervasive divinity, temple worship, sacraments, manifold deities, the Guru Shishya tradition, and a reliance on the Vedas as scriptural authority. Grasping this overview of Hinduism structure is essential to gain a clear understanding of the contemporary Hindu temple. I have met many Hindus, particularly in North America, who find the multiplicity of deities 
present in many temples to be a source of confusion. This is even more the case in temples that have deities from Saivism, Vaishnavism, and Shaktism all in the same hall. An understanding of the four traditions can provide worshippers with valuable insights into the quandary, making it clear which parts of a temple are traditionally Vaishnava, for example, and which represent the other denominations. Oh, there's one temple in the U.S. I think it has 34 different shrines. It's got every deity. It's got a beautiful shrine for Ayyappan, for example. <clears throat> Including the denominations of sectarian worship and answering the question, who is a Hindu, also helps distinguish the Hindu from the non-Hindu who is studying Hindu philosophy or practicing yoga. The importance of this distinction may not be readily apparent, like other religions, Hinduism has a hierarchy of beings in the inner world who work with those in the physical world who are Hindus by birth or conversion or adoption. The working together of the inner and outer worlds happens most fully in the temple. In those sacred precincts, the deity and the multitude of angelic beings or devas are able to bless, uplift, and purify devotees. Those who hold a Hindu philosophy but have not yet fully entered the faith do not receive the same blessings from the deity. They have not given the deity permission to work with them in this way. It's a nice way of saying it. Permission is given when one formally joins the Hindu religion. It is also important to mention that Hindus new to the religion through birth or conversion do not simply join Hinduism. Rather, they join one of Hinduism's denominations and receive a traditional name through the Nama Karana Samskara, name-giving sacrament. And some thoughts from Gurudeva on blessings being received from the deity. The gods can be and are seen by mature souls through an inner perception they have awakened. The psychic awakening is the first initiation into religion. Every Hindu devotee can sense the gods even if he cannot yet inwardly see them. This is possible through the subtle feeling nature. Not the ordinary feeling nature, but the subtle feeling nature. He can feel the presence of the gods within the temple and he can directly see their influence in his life. And the original text says, we offer this explanation as a catalyst and encourage Hinduism today readers to send letters to the editor, sharing additional reflections on what makes a Hindu a Hindu. So these are just three answers. Certainly, you know, could come up with four or five or six answers. But three different ones, very different approaches. We're three different kinds of people. And second topic, continuing the series of 64 character qualities from a character building workbook. And we're up to the letter C. Calmness is the seventh character quality. How would you define calmness? The workbook gives this definition. Calmness means remaining serene, composed, and undisturbed. It is cultivated by quieting my emotions when I am challenged or upset. Its opposite is agitation. We did a quote from Yoga Swami. Sometime in the last few months, it said, don't hurry, don't become agitated. So we want to stay calm even in situations where the people around us are not calm. Gurudeva explained, if you are not peaceful, you are still reacting to past habit patterns. If you don't feel peaceful, pretend that you do. Feel peace, feel everybody feeling that same calmness right now. 
And another quote from Gurudeva, the mind becomes calm through your understanding of experience and how experience has become created. So if you can accept the fact that you create every experience you go through, then that helps you be calm more quickly. Clouding is a mirror of the mind, that reflective pond of awareness, which when calm sees clearly, or the ripples of disturbance on the mind surface distort seeing and confuse understanding. And the last quote here, if your emotions are upset and you're suffering, there's an area within you that's calm, peaceful, dynamic, vibrant watching. That's the body of the soul. So well, that's a wonderful perspective. It's only the emotions that get disturbed. The soul is always calm. So if we can move awareness from our emotions into our soul, then we're calm. So calmness is always within us. We don't have to create it. We just have to move awareness into that state of consciousness. Reflection, take a moment to identify a few ways in which you could improve in calmness. Something we could all do, I'm sure. And our third topic, as usual, looking at quotes from Yogaswami's words of our master. Now, we don't control the mind, we remain summa with a controlled mind. For anyone who doesn't know what summa means, it means stillness. It's almost a word that means stillness. Summa iru, be still. We don't control the mind, we remain summa with a controlled mind. What does that mean to you? Controlling the mind implies you are making a conscious effort to do so. The goal is to have a quiet mind without needing to make any effort to control it. It is naturally quiet. So the state of making a conscious effort to control it is good, but that's not the ultimate state. We're trying to get to a state where we've quieted the thoughts so well that there's no effort to remain still. A related one. All thoughts must die. Alas, how difficult that is. What does that mean to you? Oh, I pull two meanings out of it. First, the state of having no thought requires a lot of hard work. Second idea is it is achievable. So even it is achievable, but it requires a lot of hard work. A oh, very interesting combination of ideas. Thank you very much. Oh.
Oh. Oh.